is a poet, novelist, and point-and-shoot photographer. She is the author of a new chapter book slash art book, Looking for Ireland, an Irish Appalachian pilgrimage, 2017. A psychological thriller set in Ireland, The Silver Tattoo, 2013, and a short story prequel, Night Terrors, and poetry collection, Lake Effect. Laura has been widely published in the United States and Ireland and received a fellowship award for literature from the West Virginia Commission on the Arts. She was featured on a Prairie Home Companion, Poetry Daily, O Magazine, and read her poetry with Ray Bradbury in 2003 and was invited to sign her books with Laura Roberts in 2017. Everyone, Laura Tracy Bentley. Thank you all for popping in. <laughs> <laughs> our pleasure. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems, and not too many because that puts people to sleep, and then I'm going to read a short section from the psychological thriller, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about um, this one, Looking for Ireland. This is my newest book, Mountain State Press, published. And uh, I always have taken photographs and in recent years, I started pulling them together and, and with some poems that I've written in, in Appalachia and in, in Ireland. And so it was fun to sit down with a graphic artist and she was like, well, maybe you should put this poem with this picture. And you know, anyway, it was fun to see what she came up with in my vision of, of the project. Uh, uh, millions of years ago, they they claim that the Appalachian Mountains went across the Atlantic Ocean from Appalachia to Northern Ireland. And it is said that they have found remnants of the Caledonia, those are called the Caledonia Mountains, on, on the floor of the ocean. So at maybe at one point in time, millions of years ago, we were actually connected. And I like to think that that might have been one of the reasons that so many people from Celtic country settled in Appalachia, you know, Irish, Scottish, Welsh. And um, I've been there a few times, I've been lucky enough to go there a few times, and I always felt so welcome over there, and it's so green. I'm talking about Ireland now. And um, people are so friendly. And the first time I went was 1993, I think. 94. 94. And it was like tr time travel back in time. Have you all been to Ireland or any of the Scottish? Okay. Well, I was staying with a family, and it was kind of like, you know, they hung their clothes on the line like, like my mom did and my grandmother did. And I, I did a little bit, <laughs> but not much. And they still had milk delivered in glass bottles on the doorstep. And I went, oh, wow. You know, so it was kind of like time travel. And the, the women, and, and the men too, dressed in dark clothing that, that wasn't like a Paris, wasn't like stylish, mm -hmm. people walking down in, in heels or something, but it was just very um, home-like to me, and I really loved being there. Um, so my vision for this book uh, is that I have imagined a walk from, from Appalachia to Ireland in words, poems and photographs that I've taken. And this this picture right on the front here, if you can see it, is um, I took it in County Sligo and it's a statue and it's dedicated to the fishermen uh, that were lost at sea because they have lost many, many over the you know the hundreds and hundreds of years. And the name of the statue is Waiting on Shore and it always kind of gives me cold chills. It's a sad reaching out. So, and part of my, my fascination with Ireland is my grandfather was born in uh, County Galway, and I have two sets of great-grandparents who were born in Ireland. So, I have a lot of Irish ancestry on, on my father's side of the family. And I did the DNA thing, have you all done that? <laughs> And I, it came up that I was almost 75% Irish, and, the, and they can even tell you what part of Ireland. Mine's mainly Galway, West Coast, you know. And I have a f good friend who is a native, Ir you know, born in Ireland, lived there all her life, and she lived in Dublin, and she had her DNA done, and she 
was like 75% English. <laughs> I said, oh, well, you just never know, you know, by looking at people. Because I thought she would be 100% Irish. So I'm going to read a few poems from this. And uh, in, this is one photo that I took. I'll do like picture book down here. Uh, and the poem is called Amulets. And a certain time of year, we have a cabin in the woods, and the, the sun reflects off of the trees like in golden and red splinters, you know, down the trunk. And it's all, only a certain time of the year, and I, was, I captured that, and I just love that time of the year. So we begin in Appalachia, and this is near a big lake of where our cabin is, and these were tundra swans that were um, migrating, and it was in November, and I saw them on the lake, and I rushed over there to take their photograph. And they don't, they, they move away from you. They're, they, they're not friendly swans like, you know, that think you're going to feed them breadcrumbs <laughs> and come toward you. They go, no. <laughs> so those were the, the tundra swans, and I love that I got the reflection mm -hmm. of them on the, on the water. Um, a lot of the photographs I take are, are within a, probably a block from my house. And I was telling the last group I was doing to talk about um, this book and other books that I've written that sometimes the magic is just within reach from your fingertips. I mean, you just you just have to you have to be able to see it. And sometimes our lives are so busy that we just can't you know you can't stop thinking about bills and kids and and all the things that are going on in life that that you can really zero in on one leaf on a on a brick street that captured me. So that. Uh, as I show you some of these pictures, you'll see what I'm talking This is a path that I walk all the time, but in the seasons, you know, in fall, it's gorgeous. And it could be a path anywhere, you know, and people uh, gravitate to that picture because it reminds them of home, or and it's just nearby. This is just a tiny puddle <laughs> that froze over with a leaf in it. And here again, very close to my house. So you just have to, you know, kind of be aware, and you don't have to have, you don't have to go to the Grand Canyon and take a selfie and fall to your death to take a good picture. <laughs> it might just be right outside your door or outside your window. Um, this is a shoe that I saw in, in the autumn leaves that probably a little girl threw out the window, <laughs> and I had to take a picture of it. Oh, okay. And this one, this is a good example of what I'm saying, things that uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, this is a pothole. <laughs> and there's a reflection of the trees in the pothole, the muddy water. So, and then I have a neighbor, he's in his 90s now, and when we first moved there just a few years ago, he came down and he said, you have to come up on the hill, except there's a a fawn in my pole and so I grab my camera and I don't know if you can see. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. You know, and that's, you know, that's just like a hundred feet away from the back door. Um, but the thing with photography, and I'm just a point and shoot photographer, you know, and I think with the advent of cell phones it's wonderful because people can take pictures of if you see a customer run, <laughs> she's, she's <laughs> waiting at the table. So oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Every yeah, she, like, she stood there for a while. Oh, that's okay. I wasn't sure. I'm sure she was resting. But uh, the the things that are uh, around us, if you keep your camera handy, now people have their cell phones mm -hmm. and they have. They, you can take a picture of things that you might normally not want to spend film on, you know, mm -hmm. 100 years ago when we still developed film. I still am going through withdrawal, not being able to buy my Kodak film. <laughs> uh, th these two pictures, this one is, this is leaving Appalachia, and I live in Huntington. This is a path in the back of the Huntington Museum of Art. They have a tra hiking trail back there. Yeah. And then this is, this is with the crossover to Ireland, and that's that the Aran Islands. With a palette with ferns growing wow. through it. So we'll reach the little crossover poem as we leave Appalachia and then go to Ireland. The poet takes a walk. 
An old woman I met by chance said we'd not meet again for a hundred years. I look forward to our reunion. <laughs> so, and I did meet a, an elderly woman on one of my walks. Took a lot of walks by myself, and um, and I, and I said something similar to her. You know, she was just so nice, and then but you know she was obviously up in years and so you know you're not. I'm not going to see her again. But I saved her in a poem. I saved her in a poem. This picture I took of a busker, a uh, street musician on Grafton Street in uh, downtown Dublin. And he was spray painted silver from his top hat to his toes to his gloves, everything. And he, and every time somebody would put money in a bucket in front of him, he would turn his boombox on real loud and blow bubbles and move around and dance. And, but he only did it for like 15 seconds because he needed more money in the bucket. <laughs> so then he would freeze like a statue until, until the money would go. And the, one of the reasons I want to point this out to you because uh, this picture became the first chapter of my novel. Um, it, it's the first, the opening chapter of The Silver Tattoo, which is a psychological thriller. So I. I, I love to be inspired by photographs. It kind of pulls me through uh, poetry and novels and so on. And I had no intention of writing a novel because I'm a poet. <laughs> but I framed this picture along with some others when I got home. And every time I walked by it in, in my hallway, uh, I would look at it. And then I, I joined a little writing group. And I thought, well, I could write a short story and start with that. So that's what happened. That became the beginning or the trigger trigger of the novel. And many, you know, a number of years later the novel was finished. This is a deer with it just an unusual shadow. And I didn't oh, see it yeah. I didn't see it till I cropped the picture. And here again not very far from my house. This is my shadow in Ireland. <laughs> and I, I just read a quote by, uh, his name will come to me in a minute. Um, he, he said something on the order of, a shadow was, was not just a shadow, it's the body of your soul. And I went, wow. <laughs> so, you know, we always wonder, can you see the soul? Is there a soul? You know, all these questions people ask. And then when there's a shadow, and it's the body of the soul. So, oh boy, I'll never think about a shadow uh, the same way twice now. Wow, indeed. <laughs> yes. These are just uh, crows in a, in a tree, and I have ravens in, in the novel. So, and this is a real dramatic uh, statue in do downtown Dublin. It's called, it's dedicated to the children of Lear, L-I-R. And it's a famous legend over there. And uh, what you're what you're looking at is swans shooting up upward, and children who've who've aged 300 years falling from the bodies of the swans. So it's a kind of a gruesome image. But uh, according to legend, an evil stepmother, and there's always an evil stepmother somewhere. <laughs> always. She put a curse on step-step-children, three boys and a girl, and they were condemned to, you know, uh, not come home again for 300 years till they heard the matin bells ring. And so when they finally were released from this bell after 300 years, they were ancient and decrepit and dying, and then, then they fall from the bodies of the, of the swans. So that's an interesting legend. This one was taken in Northern Ireland. It's just, it's just a window, but I just liked it. So uh, it, it almost looked like an eye. I think that's that's why I like it. These are just scenes that I took, pictures I took on walks. And this one uh, is a black and white picture of the cliffs of Moore. And I took it with my husband's 35 millimeter camera with black and white film. And I didn't. I wasn't very good at it because you have to do auto adjust, self adjust, and you know all that stuff. But it came out, and I was so thrilled. But this ledge that you see people standing on there—I don't know if you can see or not. 
uh, is the infamous ledge at the Cliffs of Moore where a lot of people climb over the walls and go and they lie down on the edge of it and look down straight at the ocean. Mm -hmm. So it's a real dangerous area and they try to keep people out of there now, but a lot of people fall to their deaths anyway uh, or want to. So, and I use that ledge in my novel. So see what happens is I went over to the Cliffs of Moore so many times on my walk. Uh, I was writer in residence on the west coast of Ireland for a month, so, you know, when you walk and go to some same place over and over again, you know, it's, it's going somewhere. So I used that as a couple scenes in the novel. Okay, these are uh, just pretty pictures, pretty landscapes. And this was in Limerick, and um, I was looking out my hotel window, and it's a picture of a, a young boy and he's through, 10 stories high, a mural of his face, and then the clock tower in front of him. And when I first saw it, I thought it was the Virgin Mary, or, you know, like a picture of the Virgin Mary because he had the white cap on, and I thought it was... And then I found out that it was a project to elevate teens in the area, you know, make them feel valued, and they, they, I think they actually helped paint the murals, and these were actual pictures of teens in the area that you would mm -hmm. see. So, if I, and I love that I caught the sunlight on one side, and I love the vertical lines of the building that cut across the space. So, always take your camera with it. You never know what you're going to take. And you don't have to be a professional photographer, because I'm definitely not anything like that. This is the last poem, and I got this really good picture of the moon. And I, not in Ireland, but I was lying on the floor of my bedroom, <laughs> trying to hold still to take it. And um, I did get the craters really good. And um, you don't have to have a tripod. You just use a friend or your husband or significant other, and you lean against them <laughs> to steady the, so the camera doesn't shake. So I, I'm famous for using lots of people and things as a tripod or source for me. So I thought I'd read you the one from uh, a poem from here about the, the busker on Grafton Street, and then I'm going to read you a real short section from the novel, and then you'll, you'll recognize uh, part of that. It's called Grafton Street. Each time a coin chimes inside the galvanized bucket, the silver statue comes to life and salutes the crowd. Calliope music blares in the busker like lifts a plastic wand to blow soap bubbles that float aloft like iridescent wishes into the summer air. A little girl chases after the shimmering bubbles, laughing and mesmerized by their magic, always just out of reach. So if you see up close, you see her reaching for the bubbles, and it was just one of a lucky shot, you know. <laughs> I don't. And that, like I said, inspired the opening chapter, which I thought I'd read to you all in the time I have left, and it's short, so <laughs> I don't want to put you to sleep. It's very interesting. Please okay. do it. You're doing an awesome job. Oh, thank you. Um, and I had a quote at the beginning of it, and it's uh, like the ghost of a snow field in summer. And the title above this, this opening chapter is Dublin, Ireland, 2000. Each time a coin chimes inside the galvanized bucket, Leah watches the silver statue come to life. Calliope music blares and the street performer salutes the crowd. Festooned with a stovepipe hat, opaque monocle, gloves, and cane, he blows soap bubbles that float aloft like iridescent wishes into the summer air. You're echoing of the poem there. The incense of fresh roasted coffee mingles with the delicate tea rose and lemon scent of tulips, bundles of yellow and red, tiered on a Grafton Street cart. A little girl chases after the shimmering bubbles, laughing and mesmerized by their magic, always just out of reach. When the music stops, the man freezes in place. The child begs her mother for another coin to revive the man in the silver suit who peers out vacantly from his one unmasked 
lie. When the child's plea is ignored, she skips over to Leah. Do you have some change? She asks, eyes dancing with mischief. Fiona, get over here right now, this minute, her mother commands, grabbing the child's hand. The man's bucket is chained to an old perambulator frame that holds a spray-painted crate for his boombox with a container of liquid soap and a replica of the RCA Victor Pup balanced on top. A crude sign cautions beware of dog. Leah laughs to, her, to herself, captivated by this magical one-man show. Another hand-lettered sign wedged between the pram's front wheels commands, feed me so I can have a life. So she does, to Fiona's delight and her mother's despair. Leah takes a few pictures with her old 35 millimeter camera and notices an impish man with thinning hair skinned back into a lanky ponytail. Sunglasses grip his head like a dark tiara. He jockeys for position, snapping photos with an expensive camera as the curious and the young gather round the monochromatic Pied Piper when he springs back to life. This time, a breeze co coaxes a menagerie of bubbles from his plastic wand. Fiona balances on tiptoe, giggling and stretching her small pink hands skyward toward a huge undulating orb. In one flick of his cane, the silver man impales it. The crowd gasps, then exhales ghostly boos of disapproval. Marooned by all but one of his new disciples, the busker completes his act unfazed. The perfumed air seems to be replaced by a faint electrical smell like ozone after a lightning strike. When the man becomes a sterling tableau in the setting sun, Leah stares into his unblinking moonstone eye. Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> so evil is coming. <laughs> so any man that would take his cane and pop that child's little bubbles, you know, you know he's evil. So that that's the opening. Uh, scene that came from a picture, and the main character's name is Leah, and then there's a there's a, a kind of a psychic uh, character, her husband, whose name is Connor, and um, it's you know it's a psychological thriller. So what you learn about psychological thrillers is is that the main character, or the protagonist, is never safe for very long. <laughs> she might be safe for an afternoon or you know a couple hours, but then something always triggers something else, and they have you know they keep running, running, running. So it was great fun to write, and uh, I am so happy you all came in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.